The Valyrian Freehold was a great territory that spanned much of the continent of Assos, but has fallen to ruin, brought down by a cataclysmic event known as the Doom of Valyria. Culture that had been prospering for 5,000 years was lost in one day. Spells, knowledge and recorded history were lost in the Doom, and the Century of Blood, a period of chaos in Assos, followed the disaster. The Valyrians of old are believed to have traveled as far as Old Town, predating the arrival of the First Man and trading with the other races. Some also claimed that Valyrians came to Vasteros because their priests prophesied that the Doom of Man would come out of the land beyond the Narrow Sea. There are also speculations on some tragedy falling upon them that led them to shun Vasteros ever after. Valyria was once a minor civilization of peaceful sheep herding folk dwelling on the Valyrian Peninsula, until the Valyrians discovered dragons layering in the Fourteen Flames, a ring of volcanoes on the peninsula. The Valyrians tamed the dragons with magic and mastered the technique of raising and training the dragons into devastating weapons of war. Dragons were controlled by whips, magic horns and sorcery. They began expanding their influence, establishing the freehold with Valyria as its capital. Magic flowered, topless towers rose toward the heavens where dragons soared and smiths used spells to forge Valyrian steel weapons of legendary strength and sharpness. The sorcerers of the freehold could see across mountains, seas and deserts with one of glass candles. They could enter a man's dreams, give him visions and speak to one another half a world apart, seated before their candles. The Valyrians had no kings, but instead called themselves freehold, because all the citizenry who held land had the voice. Archons might be chosen to help lead, but they were elected by the Lord's Freeholder from amongst their number, and only for a limited time. The Valyrian nobility valued purity of blood. Therefore, the practice of incest was common in old Valyria, as the Valyrians would customarily wed brother to sister. These practices were not limited to the freehold. On Dragonstone, the Targaryens continued to practice incestuous marriage and polygamy to keep the dragon bloodline pure. Some 5,000 years ago, in the early days of Valyria, the old empire of Geese dominated and controlled much of Assos. The Giscari attempted to stop Valyria's expansion and the burgeoning freehold was involved in a series of great wars against the old empire. The Giscari lockstep legions, comparable to modern days and solid, attacked Valyria five times, but they could never defeat them. With the help of dragons, Valyria was able to defend and emerge victorious each time. Finally, in the last of the Giscari wars, the Valyrians marched on their capital, Old Geese, raised it to the ground and sowed its fields with salt, sulfur and skulls, obliterating it and thereby destroying the old empire of Geese. Adopting slavery from Geese, Valyria expanded its influence over the surviving Giscari colonies of Slaver's Bay and continued to conquer and colonize, turning vast, capturing many slaves from conquered lands and using them to mine great wealth from the Fourteen Flames, as well as built great cities and roadways that led to Valyria. Valyria sent slaves of a hundred different nations to the mines beneath the Fourteen Flames, searching for gold, silver and other ores. The worst slaves were sent down to die in the red darkness of the mines. The mines of old Valyria were always hot and they grew hotter as shafts were driven deeper into the earth. The slaves toiled in an oven, the rocks around them too hot to touch. The air stank of sulfur and seared the slaves' lungs as they breathed. Sometimes when they broke through a wall in search of gold, they would find steam, boiling water or molten rock. Certain shafts were cut so low that slaves had to crawl or bend. Sometimes fireworms, creatures that breathe fire but have no wings, were encountered in that red darkness in the shafts of the mines by the slaves, leaving only burnt and blackened corpses, yet still the mines grow deeper. Slaves perished by the score, but their masters did not care. According to some scholars, the dragon lords regarded all faiths as equally false and looked down on clergy and temples as relics of more primitive times, but useful to placate the lower classes with promises of a better life to come after death. Thus, they promoted religious tolerance in order to keep their subjects divided and prevent them from unifying under the banner of a single god. Valerians themselves had a number of different gods, including Valerian, Miraxis, Vagar, and Cyrax. 
For many years the Valyrians were at peace with the Rhoynar civilization of the Rhoyne, west of the Valyrian Peninsula. From the colonial freehold of Volantis, the Valyrians, instead of fighting Rhoynar, crossed the Rhoyne and marched west to wage war on the Andals of Andalus. Rather than be enslaved by Valyria, the Andals crossed the narrow sea and invaded Westeros. The Valyrians overwhelmed the remaining Andals of western Assas and established colonies west of their peninsula. The Rhoynish Wars began almost a thousand years before Aegon's conquest, when three dragon lords from the Valyrian Freehold joined Volantis in destroying the Rhoynish port Sarhoi on the Summer Sea. The Rhoynar responded by uniting under Prince Garin of Croyan, the wonder of the Rhoyne, who temporarily made Valyria tremble. Garin led a Rhoynish army of 250,000, which conquered Selhoris, Valisar, and Volonteris, where they defeated three dragons with Rhoynish water wizards. The alarmed Volontines sought help from Valyria itself, and the dragon lords responded by sending 300 dragons. The Valyrians crushed Garin's army with their dragons, then destroyed Sarmel and Croyan. According to legend, the men of Volantis and Valyria hung Garin in a golden cage and mocked him as he called upon Mother Ruin to destroy them. That very night, the waters rose and drowned the invaders of Croyan. From that day, the spirits of the fallen conquerors have said to have remained beneath the waters. According to Tyrion Lannister, Garen's curse is only grayscale. Many a voyager in the Saros has been lost. Pole boats, pirates and great river galleys too. They wander forlorn in the mists searching for a sun they cannot find until madness or hunger claim their lives. Princess Nymeria of Nisar led the exodus of the remaining Rhoynar out of Assos, eventually arriving in Dorne. The singers say her 10,000 ships were filled with women and children, suggesting most of the men of fighting age had died in the conflict with the Freehold. The Valyrians had great skill in shaping stone. It is often said that the old wizards of Valyria did not cut or chisel stone, but worked it with fire and magic as a potter might work clay. Although much of their knowledge is now lost, Valyrians had a powerful magic which could liquefy stone and shape it how they wanted. Valyrian roads, known as Dragon Roads, still exist as monuments to their work, as do the Castle of Dragonstone and the Black Wall and Long Bridge of Volantis. The three cities, the self-ruling daughters of Valyria, are spread throughout western Assas. Volantis and Tirosh began as military outposts, while Mir and Pentos were founded by merchants in Andal territory. Dragon lords established Lys as a pleasure retreat. Religious refugees founded Lorat, Norvos, and Kohor. Isaria was founded as a colony near the kingdom of Sarnor. Bravos was founded by slaves who rebelled against the Valyrian slaving fleet, and this secret city did not accept the rule of Valyria. The Valyrian peninsula contained cities Oros and Tyria. Near Volantis were built Selhoris, Volonteris, and Valisar. South of the painted mountains were Porash, Mantaris, and Tolos, while located in Slaver's Bay were Velos on the Isle of Cedars and Elyria. The greatest remnants of the old empire of Geese were Astapur, Marine. South of the Summer Sea, the Freehold controlled Gorgosos on the Isle of Tears, and also had three failed colonies at Basilisk Point in Sotorios. Some two centuries before the doom, the Valyrian Freehold colonized the island of Dragonstone in the Narrow Sea and established a citadel there, with ineffective resistance from the local lords of Blackwater Bay. The island was the westernmost outpost of the Freehold. Twelve years prior to the doom, Daenys Targaryen, the maiden daughter of Aenar Targaryen, had a vision of the destruction of Valyria. House Targaryen abandoned their homeland for Dragonstone, an act seen by other dragonlords as cowardice. Nearby Driftmark had already been settled by House Valerion, a lesser Valyrian family, and Clawile became ruled by the Valyrian Saltigars. The doom of Valyria was a cataclysmic event after which the city Valyria was utterly destroyed and the Valyrian freehold crumbled and was no more. The doom fragmented the land surrounding the city itself into numerous smaller islands, creating the smoking sea between them. The area is now described as demon haunted and most people are afraid to go there as all known expeditions to the shattered peninsula has ended up in failure. At its height, the Freehold's capital, Valyria, 
was the greatest city in the known world, the center of civilization. Most of Valeria's culture, language and craft was lost in the doom. Valerian descendants scattered across the world, many across the surviving Valerian colonies, the free cities, and across the cities of Slaver's Bay. Many of the surviving Valerians intermarried and became mixed with other people. Their descendants speak in various local dialects of Valerian. Valerian freehold may be gone, but its descendants continue to reshape the realm. Giscar is a region of sulfur Nassos located on the eastern coast of the Gulf of Grief. And Giscari Empire is the oldest civilization in the world that can back up its claims with reliable written records that provide proof that the Giscari Empire actually predated the Long Night. Though at those times it was just making first steps towards becoming an empire. Thus, during the recovery period after the Long Night, Giscari Empire was gathering its strength. Its cradle is old Giz, whose architecture was dominated by massive brick towers and pyramids built using slave labor. The legendary founder of the city, Grazdan the Great, founded the famous Giscari Lockstep Legions, consisting of free men with their tall shields and free spears, reputed to have been nearly unbeatable on the battlefield. Apparently, it was the first disciplined army in history. Having a strong professional army, Old Giz proceeded to colonize its surroundings and dominate their neighbors, enslaving them. Thus was the first empire born, with a harpy as its symbol, a fanged woman with leathery wings for arms, the legs of an eagle and the tail of scorpion, holding a thunderbolt in her claws. The Giscari Empire's reach through time extended to nearby Satorios, where it conducted slaving raids and through time built several colonies. Gorosh at Wyvern Point, Zametar at the mouth of the Zamoyos, and Gorgai on the Isle of Tears. Indeed, the Giscari Empire was flourishing and building massive pyramids thousands of years before the rise of the Valyrian Freehold, when the Valyrians were only humble shepherds. Yet these shepherds eventually brought an end to the empire. 5,000 years ago, when the Valyrians discovered and mastered dragons and began to conquer outwards, the Giscari Empire sought to put a halt to their expansion. The two great rivals fought five great wars. The massive Giscari legions marched against the Valyrians, but each time they were defeated by the Valyrian dragons. Much of the fighting took place in and around the Valyrian Peninsula, and what would later become known as Slaver's Bay. The Giscari, of course, won some skirmishes, as there is a large ancient tapestry in the heart of the Great Pyramid in Myrene, showing the last survivors of a defeated Valyrian army passing beneath the yoke and being chained. But in the last Fifth Great War, the Valyrians smashed the Giscari legions and used dragons to burn Gis and its pyramids to the ground. After Gis was burnt, the Valyrians sowed the fields with salt and skulls, to prevent any surviving inhabitants from returning. The Valyrians conquered the surviving Giscari people, as well as their outlying colonies throughout the region, including Astapor, Yunkai, and Mirin. Many of the Giscari were slain, and many more were enslaved and died laboring for their conquerors in 14 flames mines in Valyria. With the empire collapsing, the original Giscari bloodline was nearly wiped out, along with its religion, culture, and language. Giscari, known as slavers from the beginning of times, became slaves themselves. For thousands of years, the Giscari people were ruled by the Valyrian Freehold, and through time the very few Giscari who survived the destruction of the Empire intermingled with other people who were conquered by the Valyrians and incorporated into their colonies. So the bloodline of the Giscari Empire actually runs very thin in modern-day Slaver's Bay. However, after the doom fell upon Valyria, the cities of Slaver's Bay were able to throw off the Valyrian shackles, reasserting their independence during the Century of Blood. Yet, the echo of the doom was felt throughout the lands of the Old Empire. Gorosh and Kozai, for example, were washed away by gigantic ocean waves during the doom. The Froki Colossars, not restricted by dragon lords anymore, destroyed northern Giscari colonies, whose ruins are now called Krasash Has, meaning Sharp Mountains, originally Kartak, Vesmechha, City of Horse, and Vesefe, City of Shackles. 
whatsoever, handful of aristocrats gained advance of the situation, establishing great wealth and power by ruthlessly exploiting a vast slave population, to the point that the entire geographical region became known as Slaver's Bay. They developed slave trade with the Dothraki, often buying slaves captured in their own colonies, growing rich and powerful by breeding, training and trading slaves throughout the region. These elites began to call themselves masters, looking back into the past glories of the old empire as a way of reasserting their power and independence. Though the Giscari of old won their slaves by conquest, and these new masters purchased their own distant kin, broke their will and reselled them at the slave markets. They became so rich that even founded the new Gis on an island further south of the bay. The masters of new Gis formed iron legions in mimicry of the legions of the old empire, but unlike the unsullied, these are free men, as the soldiers of the old empire were. After they regained their independence, the slaver cities of Astapor, Yunkai and Mirin also began using harpies on their flags, emulating the harpy symbol of the old Giscari empire with the minor differences. Even though these monsters got no actual ties with the old empire, they still think of it as their empire clinging to its glories. The original language of the Giscari Empire, now known as Old Giscari, went extinct as the Valyrians forced their subjects to speak Valyrian. Old Giscari did influence the common variant of Valyrian, which developed in Slaver's Bay, mostly in a few loan words, such as Misa, meaning mother, and a few grammatical structures. After gaining their independence, Giscari still kept speaking the Valyrian language. This wealthy slaver elite that has forgotten their own tongue, these old names with fat purses play mock wars at the fighting pits with their slave soldiers, pretending to be of the blood of old Gis, sitting atop their pyramids and drinking apricot wine. As a sign of high station, they wear the tokar, an impractical outfit that requires the wearer to hold it in place with one hand and walk in small steps. High-born men also wear hair teased, oiled and twisted into fantastic shapes, such as horns or wings. They are also fond of rich food including duck eggs, octopus stew and even dog. It is said that Giscari will eat meat of any creature except man or dragon. The Giscari still worship the gods of old Gis, with graces as their priestesses. The Green Grace is the topmost religious figure in the Giscari city. It is known that the Giscari considered the blood spilled in the fighting pits a sacrifice most pleasing to their gods. Pity they don't fight in the pits themselves to honor their gods. They are not fond of dying, it seems. Maybe they just do not want to be buried in crypts below their own monses, below their living kin, as it is accustomed there in between those who own a mons. Bricks and blood built Astapur, and bricks and blood her people, an old rhyme says referring to the red-bricked walls of the city and of the blood shed by the slaves who constructed them. Astapur is an old city but not as populous as Lys, Pantos or Karf, and is renowned mostly for the special slaves it produces, the Ansawid, eunuch slave soldiers trained from a young age in Astapur to unquestioning obedience. Ansawid begin as young male slaves chosen for their size, speed and strength. Boys chosen are then fully castrated with their penis and testicles cut, and their manhoods burned at the altar of the Lady of Spears, the great goddess of the Ansawid, of whom they are forbidden to speak to others. Their training starts at age 5 and is from dawn to dusk. It is brutal, designed not only to teach them how to fight, but to strip away all individuality, empathy and self-worth. On the day a boy is cut, he is given a puppy to take care of. At the end of the first year, the boy is made to strangle the puppy. Should he fail to do so, he is killed and fed to the surviving dogs. Boys that fail any aspect of their training are killed, so only a third of them survive to become unsullied. Castration means that they cannot be as strong as whole men, but this is more than made up for by discipline. They also regularly consume an elixir called the wine of courage to deaden their sensitivity to pain. They drink it with every meal and through time feel less and less pain. Every day they choose new names at random by drawing tokens from a bucket, each consisting of a color and a type of vermin, such as grave worm. 
to win their spiked cap, they must take a silver mark, go to the slave markets, and buy a newborn slave child, and kill it before its mother, and pay the slave's owner for his loss. And so they're used as guards all over the free cities, being sold by thousands. The good masters, the slavers of Astapur, used to sell and sell in groups of ten for household guards, but that proved unsound since they mingle with others and forget who they are. It is well known that the Ansawid make excellent guards. Also, they do not loot and, of course, will never rape. The only vice left for the Ansawid is food, so Ansawid serving as household guards often grow fat. There is red dust everywhere in Astapur, dancing down the gutters at each gust of wind, so Astapuri women veil their faces to keep the brick dust from their eyes as it stinks worse than sand. City is most beautiful at dusk when the good masters light silk lanterns on every terrace so all the pyramids glow with colored lights. Pleasure barges ply the warm river, playing soft music and calling at the little islands for food and wine and other delights. The city is poorly defended and even a modest kalasar could take it, but none have ever tried because of Ansalid. Yunkai, the Yellow City, is a most disreputable place for the city's main export is bad slaves, boy whores and wars. The men who rule it call themselves the Wise Masters. A slave in Yunkai learns the way of the seven sights and the sixteen seats of pleasure. Eunuchs there, for obvious reasons, are made by only cutting the testicles off. Mirin is as large as Astapur and Yunkai combined. Its walls are made of many colored bricks that are higher and better maintained than those of Yunkai, studded with bastions and anchored by great defensive towers at every angle. City contains the Temple of the Graces, a huge structure topped with golden domes. It houses the priestesses of Mirin, called the Graces. They are divided into groups, each with a specific color and specialty. Mirin is renowned for trading in slaves who are used in every aspect of life, including guards, cleaners, pit fighters, and pleasure givers. Healthy young girls and boys under 10 are especially sought after as slaves to be used in brothels. Copper is plentiful in the Giskari Hills, but the metal is not as valuable as it had been when bronze ruled the world. Cedars once grew tall along the coast, but grow no more. They were felled by the axes of the old empire, or consumed by dragonfire, when Gis warred against Valyria. Once the trees had gone, the soil baked beneath the hot sun and blew away in thick red clouds. Some think that these changes transformed Giscari into slavers, because, obviously, Marine has little to offer besides slaves, so as other Giscari cities. No wonder grace there is earned through whoring, butchery is art, and dog is considered a delicacy, and no wonder they keep clinging to their glorious past. The Andals originated in the lands of the Axe, although some say they came from south of the Silver Sea, a great inland sea in northern Assos that has been reduced to three large lakes in the grasslands, and during their travels they carved out Andalus. They brought iron weapons with them and suits of iron plates, against which the tribes that inhabited those lands could do little. Eventually, Andals conquered those lands, exterminating a race of hairy men who were believed to be cousins to the Ebenese. Holy texts teach that the Andals learned iron forging from the smith of the Seven, but since the Roinar were already an advanced civilization at that time and they too knew of iron and lived in proximity, the theory of divine interfering becomes less believable especially if known that Roinish outposts were found in Andalus, and the Andals were not the first who learned iron forging from Roinar. Whatever the truth about iron forging, it does not change fact that Andals did live in those areas for many centuries, untroubled, till their culture developed all of its formative features to the time that Huger of the Hill, according to legend and religious belief, was visited by the Seven. In the oldest of the holy books, the seven-pointed star, it is said that Huger received a vision of a god, manifesting to him as seven roped figures. Huger was supposedly crowned by the father himself, who pulled down seven stars to make his crown. 
The maid brought forth a girl, supple as a willow, with eyes like deep blue pools, that Hugo took as his first wife. The mother made her fertile, and she bore him forty-four mighty sons, as foretold by the crone. The warrior gave each son strength of arms, and the smith brought each a suit of iron plate. Thus Andals gained new gods, and these gods had their features. After all, it is easier to kill in the name of a gods who represent yourself, isn't it? And Andals were truly cruel and zealous in following their new gods, to the point of exterminating all non-believers. An old legend told in Pentos claims that the Andals slew the swan maidens who lured travelers to their deaths in the velvet hills that lie to the east of the free city. A hero whom the Pentoshi singers call Huko led the Andals at that time. Huko may well be a rendering of the name of Hugor, as you can notice. It may be considered that Huko was a true hero, killing the murderous swan maidens. But in the same song it is said that he slew the seven maids, not for their crimes, but instead as sacrifice to his gods. This notion makes one reconsider the true motives of the faith of the seven. It is also said in the seven-pointed star that the seven promised Hugor and his descendants great kingdoms in a foreign land, and that is said to be the reason for Andals to conquer Vesteros, but there may have been a better reason for Andals to leave their lands. Since with the fall of Old Gis, dragon lords of Freehold of Valyria started to expand their domains and sought more slaves. At first the Ruin and the Ruinar served as a buffer between Andals and the dragon lords, Undoubtedly, Andals might have fought against Valyrian tides at first, and the Ruinar might even have aided them, but Valyrians were unstoppable in their urge, so it is most likely the Andals chose to flee rather than face the inevitable slavery that came with Valyrian conquest. The fate of Andal King Carlon the Great may have been a great warning for the rest of the Andals. After twenty years of warfare against petty kings of Andalus, Carlon's domains stretched as far as the headwaters of the Upper Ruin and the Noin, and that eventually led to conflict with other Andal kings and the free city of Norvos. When the Norvoshi closed the Noin, Carlon defeated them twice in the hills of Norvos. Unwisely, however, he then marched against the city of Norvos. The Norvoshi sent to Valyria for help, and the freehold rose in defense of its colony. A hundred dragon lords burned Carlon the Great and his Andal host outside Norvos. The dragon lords then attacked the Lorati Isles, burning Carlon's keep. It is said nobody survived the scouring of Loroth. Fall of their mightiest king thus proved that strength of the Andals, their concept of chivalry and iron wrought armor were nothing compared with the dragons. That event may have spurred Andals to retreat to the Axe the lands from which they had sprung, and when that did not protect them, they retreated farther north and west until they came to the sea. Some might have given up there and surrendered to their fate, but many and more made ships and sailed in great numbers across the narrow sea to the lands of the first man in Westeros. Since Andal conquest of Westeros was split in separate great tides, it is likely that Andals were holding defense in Essos till their last stand, leaving the coast of the Axe and the Lorati Islands in great numbers, tide after tide. Unfortunately, it is not even known when the Andals sailed west across the narrow sea for the first time, with some sources dating the Andal invasion to 6,000 years ago, and some claiming it occurred 4,000 years ago, and then again others say it happened only 2,000 years ago. Whatever the truth, Valyrians claimed Andal lands to themselves through time, and established Mir in place of a walled Andal town, and many of the Valyrian colonists of Pentos intermarried with local Andals. The Valyrians had denied the Andals the promise of the Seven on Assos, somehow forgetting own religious tolerance. Many think that the faith of the Seven was considered by Valyrians dangerous because of the strict denial of incestuous relationships which were in the core of Valyrian culture, especially valued by dragon lords, who were able to sustain own power over dragons only by keeping the bloodline pure. However, most Andals escaped the fate of slavery and assimilation, and became even more zealous, 
after the conflict with superior enemy and the flight from the demon-like winged fire-breathing creatures with abominations atop them. So the warriors of the Andals carved a seven-pointed star upon their bodies and swore by their blood and the seven not to rest until they carved their own kingdoms in the sunset lands. Their success gave Westeros a new name, Raya Shandali, the land of the Andals, as the Defraki now name it. Andals first landed on the fingers in the Vale of Arryn. Carvings of the seven-pointed star and axe are scattered upon the rocks and stones throughout the Vale, a practice that eventually fell out of use as the Andal conquest progressed. Sweeping through the Vale with fire and sword, the Andals began their conquest of Westeros. Eventually, some of the first men submitted, though in many cases the Andals took the wives and daughters of the defeated kings to wife as a means of solidifying their right to rule. For, despite everything, the first men were far more numerous than the Andals, and could not simply be forced aside. The fact that many southern castles still have godswoods with carved weirwoods at their hearts is said to be thanks to the Andal kings, who shifted from conquest to consolidation, thus avoiding any conflict based on differing faiths. Yet still, wars were fought throughout the decades, and Andals won because of their knowledge of iron forging, since first men at those times still used the bronze weapons. Of course, advanced weapons were not the only thing that made Andals to succeed in their conquest. Those were wits and backstabs that had won them the lands for the most part. Andals made first man kings fight each other, thus weakening them, using their old grudges for own advantage. When the veil was secured, the Andals turned their attention to the rest of Westeros and poured forth through the bloody gate. In the wars that followed, Andal adventurers carved out small kingdoms from the old realms of the First Men and fought one another as often as they fought the First Men. Eventually, all the southern kingdoms fell. As with the Veil Men, some submitted to the Andals, even taking up the faith of the Seven. Stormlands, Reach, Dorne, and Westerlands fell to the iron grip of the Andals through time. Even the Ironborn fell to the wave of Andal conquest eventually. It was the North alone that was able to keep the Andals at bay, thanks to the impenetrable swamps of the Neck and the ancient keep of Moat Caelan. Andals proved to be great schemers, killers, and rulers, all in the name of their faith. But when the Dragon Lords came once more, and they did not have a place where to run. What happened then? Of what worth is the faith, if its main principles are being forgotten for the sake of survival? And then the dragons disappeared, and now they are back. And both would-be queens can be accused of incestuous relationships. Where is the faith now? The Roinar were river-faring people who dwelt on the banks of the immense river Roin and lived in city-states along its vast network. Those city-states were Arnoy, Croyon, Goyandroa, Nisar, Sarmel, and Sarhoi. The Roinar occupied this region for thousands of years and for the most part lived in peace. They were a slender people with smooth olive skin, black hair, and dark eyes who practiced a number of curious customs. These included equal primogeniture, granting inheritances to the eldest child regardless of gender. Women also served in their city's armed forces and were said to fight as fiercely as men, and Roinar also tolerated homosexuality. Due to their origin in city-states, they titled their rulers princes and princesses. The Roinar worshipped a number of river-themed nature gods. Their primary god was Mother Ruin, the personification of the river Ruin itself. Other gods included the Old Man of the River, a turtle god, and his adversary, the Crab King, who fought the Old Man of the River for dominion of all life below the flowing water. The giant turtles known as the Old Man of the River, named after a Ruinish lesser deity, were held as consorts of the Mother Ruin and considered sacred. The Ruinar used water magic to defend themselves from enemies, and were said to be the first to learn the art of iron making, and even introduced Andals to it. It is easy to believe these assumptions to be true, as remnants of Ruinish outposts 
had been found in Andalus, and it would not be the first time that men learned of the working of iron from the Ruinar, since the Valyrians themselves learned the art from Ruinar as well, although the Valyrians eventually surpassed them. The Valyrians proved to be ungrateful students though, as through time Valyrian Freehold's expansion from the east threatened to overtake the Ruinar lands. At first, the Ruinar welcomed the new arrivals, claiming that all men were welcome to share in the bounty of Mother Ruin. Valyrian adventurers, merchants and settlers expanded into Western Assas since the end of the Valyrian Giscari Wars thousands of years earlier, but over time they began to exert more and more influence on the region. The Freehold had established the city of Volantis at the mouth of the Ruin, and as the years passed, they attempted to take further control of territory along the river. They also founded two other cities, Norvos and Kohor, on tributaries of the Ruin, much further to the north. And by around the year 950 before Aegon's landing, the two civilizations came into open conflict. For some two and a half centuries, the Ruinish wars were fought between the Valyrians and the Ruinar. Most of the wars were short-lived and local in nature, since the Ruinish were by then as powerful as geese at its height, and Valyrian settlers in Volantis and other colonies had only few dragons at their disposal. While they could call upon dragon riders from Valyria when the conflicts turned dire, as soon as the riders left, the fortunes of war turned once again, though the most significant factor was that of the unity since Valyrian colonies worked together and aided one another in these conflicts, and in contrary, the individual Ruinar city-states fiercely protected their independence and, for the most part, did not present a united front against the invaders. The wars included the First Turtle War, the War of Free Princes, the Second Turtle War, the Fisherman's War, the Salt War, the Third Turtle War, the War on Dagger Lake, and the Spice War, among many others. Roinar built Sarhoi as a great port city made of pink stone with canals and saltwater gardens. During the Second Spice War, three dragon lords and men from Volantis sacked the city. The city's warriors were slaughtered and its children sold into slavery. This unprecedented Valyrian aggression escalated the centuries-long conflict and eventually led to defeat of the Roinar about 700 years before Aegon's landing. The Ruinar responded to destruction of Sarhoi by uniting under Prince Garin of Croyon, the wonder of the Ruin who temporarily made Valyria tremble. Garin led a Ruinish army of 250,000, the largest land army Assas had ever seen. He moved south along the Ruin with his army inflicting defeat after defeat and in a massive battle at Volonteris, they slaughtered the Valyrian army, 100,000 strong, killing two of the dragons and wounding the third. Garin the Great conquered Salhoris, Valisar, and Volonteris, yet these victories were short-lived, because the panicked Valentines called upon Motherland to send aid, which came in the form of 300 dragons. The Valyrians crushed Garin's army and managed to capture Garin, Odd enough, Roinar were finally defeated at the time they joined together to fight their enemy, and the enemy finally took threats seriously. Princess Nymeria of Nisar, fearing the enslavement of the people of her own city, gathered every ship that remained upon the ruin and filled them full of as many women and children as they could carry. She led these 10,000 ships down the ruin, past Sarhoi, and into the Summer Sea. During and after the Ruinar evacuation, the Valyrians destroyed the great cities of the Ruinish realm. Their massive ruins are still easily observed from the ruin. Nymeria, fleeing Valyrian wrath, led her followers on dangerous journeys to the Basilisk Isles, Satorios, Nath, the Summer Isles, the Stepstones, and finally Dorne in southern Westeros. There, Nymeria married the Dornish lord, Mors Martell of the Sandship, and helped him consolidate Dorne under his rule through Nymeria's war. Under the rule of House Nymeros Martell of Sunspear, the Ruinar have lived and intermingled with the native Dornish since that time. Croyon, nicknamed the Festival City, was once the richest and most splendid of the cities along the Ruin. Its streets were said to be made of water and its houses of gold. It contained the colossal Palace of Love, 
a magnificent island fastness. According to legend, men of Volantis and Valeria hung Prince Garin the Great in a golden cage after defeating the Ruinar in the Second Spice War. Garin allegedly called upon Mother Ruin to destroy the invaders with a curse, and that night the river's waters rose to destroy the Valentines and Valerians. The spirits of the drowned dragon lords are said to remain beneath the water, however, and their cold breath rises to become fog. There was a palace of love once in Croyan, where lovers got married. There were gardens bright with flowers and fountains sparkling golden in the sun. Its steps once rang to the sound of lovers' footsteps, and beneath the dome, marriages beyond count were sealed with a kiss. Tyrion Lannister observed that Palace of Love must have been ten times the size of the Red Keep, and a hundred times more beautiful. Now this place is called the Palace of Sorrow, and whole abandoned city sorrows. Mists rule the sorrows, and stone men, people in late stages of grayscale disease, roam the ruins, often being seen on the Bridge of Dream. They are rumored to have a leader, the Shrouded Lord, also known as His Great Grace, and the Prince of Sorrows, a mysterious figure, though many say he's just a legend. He's said to rule the mists around the Sorrows since the time of Garin, and to spread the grayscale through the Grey Kiss. According to some rumors, he's thought to be Prince Garin himself, raised from his watery grave. Others believe that there have been numerous Shrouded Lords, and when one dies, another one takes his place, and the one currently holding the title is a pirate from the Basilisk Isles. Yet there is another version of the tale, in which a shrouded lord was a statue at first, and a grey woman from the fog kissed life to it with lips as cold as ice. It is also said that the shrouded lord will grant a boon to any man who can make him laugh. Thrice each year the Triarchs of Volantis send a galley up river with provisions for the stone man. It is considered they become violent mostly because of starvation, rather than madness. Half-sunken architecture and statues pose threats to passing boats and sorrows. Many travelers become lost in the thick fog of those waters, eventually succumbing to madness, hunger, or stone man. There has not been love above the sorrows for a thousand years, so pirates are common in the ruin, north of it, although they do not enter the ruined city. Arnoy was a great city of the Ruinar, famed for its green marble halls. It was destroyed following the Ruinish Wars, along with other Ruinish cities. Goyandroa was a fair place, green and flowering, a city of canals and fountains. But now the canals are choked with reeds and mud, and pools of stagnant water give birth to swarms of flies. The broken stones of temples and palaces sink back into the earth, and gnarled old willows grow thick along the river banks. Nisar contained the palace of Princess Nymeria, but ruins are all that remains of a colossal palace of pink and green marble, with its collapsed domes and broken spiders, looming large above a row of covered archways. Cities full of crooked walls and fallen towers, broken domes and rows of rotted wooden pillars, streets choked by mud and overgrown with purple moss. Sarmel sits on the eastern bank of the ruin, and almost directly across the river to the west sits the city of Volonteris. During the Ruinish Wars, Sarmel, a pale city known for its flowers, fought with Volonteris, a colony of the Valyrian Freehold at that time. Sarmel was burned during the First Turtle War, while half of Volonteris was washed away when the Ruinar used water magic during that conflict. According to legend, this first conflict between two great civilizations began when the Valyrians killed a gigantic turtle, one of those called the Old Man of the River, by the Ruinar. During the Second Spice War, Volonteris faced the host of the Ruinish prince Garin the Great. The Valyrians lost that battle and Volonteris was flooded once again. Eventually, though, Sarmel was ruined towards the end of that last conflict and its people were enslaved by Valyria. Having abandoned the ruin, most Ruinar adopted the faith of the Seven in Vesteros. Their Dornishmen are being differentiated as stony, sandy, and salty. The salty Dornishmen are held to have the most Ruinish blood, being dark-haired, olive-skinned, and living close to the shore. The salty Dornishmen no longer speak the language of the ancient Ruinar, 
although they do speak the common tongue with a distinctive drawl. Some descendants of the Ruinar, though, did not assimilate and continued to practice the traditions of their ancestors. Called the Orphans of the Green Blood, these individuals live on rafts along the river Green Blood and consider themselves orphaned from their mother Ruin. They are of pure Ruinar blood and still speak the Ruinish language in secret. Lamas Longstrider, the famous traveler, once met descendants of the Ruinar in the ruins of the festival city of Croyon, who told him their tales of a darkness that made the Ruin River dwindle and disappear, her waters frozen. The return of the sun came only when a hero convinced Mother Ruin's many children, lesser gods such as the Crab King and the Old Man of the River, to join together to sing a secret song that brought back the day. Perhaps one day a song will be sung that will bring the Ruinar back to their mother.